Uh, next speaker is a man who I have a great respect for and I've worked with over many years in many outlets. He was, um, he was a director of the web operations at the Scotsman. Uh, he then went on to found one of the uh, earliest attempts to do sort of public news media, uh, digital news media in Scotland called the Caledonian Mercury and he, he invited me to write a column for that. Uh, he then went, I, th I don't know if this is exactly the right timeline, but then became the digital operations manager at uh, Yes Scotland and is now working for the excellent campaign site 30 Degrees um, and I think just in terms of someone who has, who will be able to give you some wisdom from hard won experience in doing politics through the digital age, uh, uh, this is your guy so could you please give a warm welcome to Stuart Kirkpatrick. Hey thank you everyone. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of my reflections on why we didn't win last time and some ideas about things we should be saying now. But the big caveat, just to follow on from that excellent presentation, is that there are things we don't know that we really, 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 really need to know if we're going to win next time. And there are questions we need to ask. Um, so I'm going to kick off by saying that um, I've not really got anything against Clack Manninshire. Apart from, in one sense, it's somewhere I never, ever want to go to again. <laughs> so on the 18th of September 2014, I downed tools um, at the Yes Scotland office at Hope Street, um, staggered across the road to the Potstill pub, which was the unofficial meeting room of the Yes Digital team. Um, I threw down a large malt of the moment, Glenn Farkless, if I remember correctly. And then I got a lift through for the results event um, at Dynamic Earth in Edinburgh. I arrived just before the Clip Manager result came in, and when it did, I knew, yeah, well, we all knew that we'd lost. Now, there are plenty of people who say that they knew we were going to lose, but I was not one of those people. I was convinced we would pull it out of the bag right up until that result. So it hit me very, very hard. And I made a promise to myself that I'm never, ever going to feel that way again. Now, it's, thank you. And there's something else that some people say, which is, it was never there. Like, we were never really going to win. I completely disagree with that. I believe we could have won. And more, I believe we should have won. And if we are going to win next time, if we are never going to feel again like we did on the 19th of September, we need to be realistic about why we lost, right? We need to be completely honest among ourselves about the reasons that we did not win. Not to indulge in finger pointing or blame games, but so that we can find the seeds of victory in the ashes of defeat. Now, we didn't lose because of the BBC, and we didn't lose because of MI5, and we didn't lose because of stuffed ballot boxes. Um, it would be really easy to comfort ourselves with those stories, but kind of easy is for losers, and I never want again to feel like I did on that night. So here it is. We lost purely and simply because we did not convince enough of the people that we needed to reach to vote yes. And if we don't learn from that, if we don't understand what we need to change about how we campaign and what messages we give, then we are distant to live through the 19th of September 2014 again. And friends, if we lose next time, I don't think there'll be a third chance in the lifetime of the people in this room. So we will be the generation who got within touching distance and then threw the prize away. And I, for one, do not want to do that. We will need to be ready for the next referendum because there's one certainty about it. Now, this is going to sound weird, but the certainty about the next referendum is it will not be as easy as it was last time, because this time, the other lot know that we can win from the get-go. Like they might have been chaotic and a bit hilarious last time, next time they will be professional. And they've got lots of money, and they've got lots of friends in the media. So we are going to have to be clever if we want to win. But I'm here to tell you that we are going to win.
Like everyone else in this room, I suspect, I started thinking about how to win the next referendum during my hangover and tears on the 19th. <laughs> so I think my first point is in some ways it doesn't actually matter at the moment what the date of the next referendum is, as far as we're concerned, right? One of my favourite proverbs is that the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago, and the second best time is today. The right time to start campaigning for an independence referendum is now. Now, I was going to go into a huge spiel about why we need to get up and do it, but then I thought about the people in the room, and I thought, Stuart, what the hell are you talking about? I doubt there's anyone in this room who stopped campaigning for independence after the last referendum. <laughs> but now is the time to get clever and start coordinating how we work together to win. Now, there have been various discussions about what that might look like, and I'm going to share with you my thoughts. Having worked at Yes Scotland, what I think we don't need is another Yes Scotland. <laughs> and I love the fact that the applause for that was led by Elaine C., who was on the board. <laughs> my, 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 there are many ways we can do this, right? My suggestion is we need a small hub to provide research coordination, strategy and communication support for the pro-independence groups that are out there already and the new ones that we need. We need facts, we need messages and we need to get on the front foot with the media so that we can drive the news agenda. And I'm looking forward to hearing what Richard has to say. We've been shown kind of a tantalising taste of the information we need but we need really in-depth research into why we lost. We need in-depth research into what will persuade those people who are persuadable. We need to find out who they are, they are, and then we need to test messages with them to find out what we can use to reach them. We also, and I'm sure there are lots of people doing this already, need to collate every possible quote from unionist politicians and from Better Together, from the last referendum, from the EU referendum, so that we can throw it back in their faces when they chuck out their scare stories in the next independence referendum. When challenged by the Tories over we don't have a plan B, we can point out that they didn't have any plan for Brexit, aside from a daft slogan slapped on the side of a bus. Now some of that work will need to be done by professionals, a lot of it will be need to be carried out by yes activists up and down the country, starting now. Because the one advantage that we have, and the reason that we will win, is us. We don't have any idea when the next independence referendum will be, and yet 800 of us have gathered here to discuss how we're going to win it. Um, I would challenge the remnants of Better Together to meet in a phone box. <laughs> but this is just the tip of the activist iceberg. Our great strength is our diversity and our commitment. So let's talk about how we deploy that. Our trump card is our grassroots network. In a low-key and a local way, we can reach some of the people that Craig talked about. Different target voter groups that we identified will need to be reached with different messages, possibly coming from different organisations. We need to embrace diversity as the path to victory. But we need to provide research and guidance to those groups. But not every grassroots organisation that's going to win this for us will be national. Some of them will be hyper-local. You know, the doorstep is where this will be won as well as in the newspapers and online. In terms of the existing groups, we can turbocharge some, we can provide healing to others, and we're going to have to create some from scratch. Who remembers pensioners for yes? Me neither. Oops. Online, our digital, digital networks are re-energizing, and we can use that to gather intel already, to do research, to test messaging. One powerful tactic we tried last time that kind of worked as we got undecideds to email in questions. We were then able to break down those into topics that showed us what different parts of the country were thinking about independence and where they had unanswered questions. We should take the tactics that worked last time and we should turbocharge them. But we need to be aware of social media echo chambers and acting like bam pots online because <laughs> I don't need to tell the people in this room that abusing people is a really dumb way to try and sell them something. So I'm going to talk a wee bit about what I think we should say now, but the, 
the caveat on this is this is guesswork, right? This is what my gut tells me, and we don't need my gut, substantial though it is. What we actually need is hard, hard information. But this is kind of my starter for 10 on what we need to do next. And here's, I think, the key message that we could deploy right now. In an uncertain world, the only security is to be in control of your own decisions. The only way to protect your pension is to be in control of it, rather than have it governed by fly-by-night speculators in the city of London. The only way to make your business thrive is to start it in a country whose economy is geared towards recognizing innovation here. The only way to secure your children's future is to make them grow up in a country whose talent and resources are deployed for its needs according to the judgment of its people. And in doing all this, we must not rerun the last independence referendum or the EU referendum. As we've seen, lots of people voted yes and then for Brexit. We need to make sure that we don't leave them behind. And if we've left them, we need to get them back. The new referendum is not about Brexit. It's a choice between a progressive, outward-looking, innovative Scotland where we are in control versus the risks of being governed by a conservative little England who looks after the interests of the home counties. While we remain in the union, the big choices about our lives are made by others, and that is just not safe or sensible. From today, I'd suggest we are in campaign mood. So let every conversation be governed by the old mantra from Yes Scotland. There's no such thing as a no voter, just a yes voter we've not persuaded yet. But let's be careful of the language we use. Like, we're all inspired by you, yes, yet, still yes, the 45. But the limited testing I've done online has found that no voters who are persuadable come to yes, they find that off-putting. So it's great for rallying the troops, but when you're selling on the doorstep, maybe talk about something else. We want to encourage as many converts as we can to come out and talk about what their journey to yes, because we want that to be seen as the reasonable, the smart, and the sensible choice. Okay, so last time we hung desperately to a few carefully chosen numbers and often we tried to speak with one voice, the white paper. I think this time we need a bucket full of hard and fast facts on every topic. And we need hard and fast, copper-bottomed, fact-checked, solid visions of an independent Scotland. Not one vision, but a multiplicity of visions designed to appeal to a multiplicity of voters. Instead of one white paper, let's give the voters a sweetie shop, a panoply of policies that will show how we can transform Scotland if we transfer power from Westminster to Holyrood. Because, you know, the question isn't actually what bleeding currency we use. The point is that the choice of currency should be up to the people who live in this country, according to the needs of this country. So whether you're in the SNP or the Greens or Labour or Rise or, like me, no party, what you're campaigning for is a notion that in an uncertain world, the safest course of action for us here in Scotland is that our resources should be deployed according to the decisions of the people who live here. I think next time, though, we need to be frank about the challenges we face. And we need to be honest about the difficulties we may face and then show that we have realistic plans to overcome them because then we can focus on the benefits of being independent and show that they far outweigh the risks of staying in the union. We don't all have to agree. We just have to show the policies and the possibilities on offer if we embrace the future. So me, I'd like to see a renewable energy boom to put the oil years to shame. I'd like to see us all share in this nation's vast wealth. I'd like a streamlined tax and benefits system so that those who should pay do and those who need help get it. And I'd like an economy that rewards small and medium-sized enterprises so that innovators and entrepreneurs thrive here. Finally, I'd like to see an end to the abomination of food banks in the 21st century. So that, that's part of my personal vision of an independent Scotland, but you don't have to agree with mine. There are 800 independent Scotlands in this room. There are five million independent Scotlands out there. Let's set them free. 
Let's set our visions free so we can persuade our friends and neighbours. So the day after the referendum, instead of nursing a dram and cursing poor Black Manninshire, we can all join together, left and right, rich and poor, yes and no, and get on with building the better nation that we know Scotland could and should be. Thank you very much.